Thank you for joining me on this walkthrough of custom triggers in jQuery. My name is David Posen, and you can find the written version of this and other articles at my blog at randomjavascript.blogspot.com. The use of triggers relies on the pub sub model, also called the radio model. It's based on two unrelated entities, one of which will be the publisher or broadcaster, and one which will be the subscriber or listener. The listener tells the engine that it is subscribing or waiting for the broadcaster to issue a certain message or event. When ready, the broadcaster broadcasts that event and the preset function on the listener is run. You see this a lot in jQuery with functions like dot .click or dot .change or dot .onclick or dot .onchange. All of those are listening to native functions which broadcast when they occur. So why use triggers when you could use regular JavaScript and pass functions around? Well, one reason would be it's easier to maintain. Triggers allow you to maintain code specific to individual pieces as opposed to worrying about an entire page's interaction, which leads us to modularity. It helps encourage you to build components and pieces that fit together without knowing about each other's existence rather than having interlocked pieces. And it's extensible. If things are reacting to triggers, then if you need to modify what the trigger does or how it responds, you only have to worry about modifying the trigger code. We're going to use Cloud9's online IDE for example today. What you have is a simple HTML form with one field, one button, and a section where we're going to put some text as changes are made to show how the triggers are functioning. We're going to start by appending a change event to all input fields on our form. When the change occurs, we're going to go ahead and trigger our custom event at the document level and provide the name of the event. And we're going to pass some data in just so we can see the event moving around uh, inside the code. Next, we're going to add the listener to the document for the event we just made. In most cases, when adding a listener in jQuery, we're used to just using the event as the parameter. However, since we have a custom trigger and we're passing our own data around, we can add these additional parameters to the function call in the same order in which they are passed from the trigger. To simulate a save message, we're going to go ahead and take the target parameter, which is the target ID from our trigger, and append it to our save area. To continue to simulate the save for the purpose of our example, we're going to show the area which now contains the target ID from the trigger. Continuing with our save conceit, we're going to have the save button, when you click it, hide the text box as if the save has been submitted to the server. So we add the click event, and we're going to use another custom trigger called change saved to pass the document. And the document will then listen for that event as well. When it finds it, it's going to hide our save text box. Let's add an example of how custom triggers can be really, really powerful. Since we already had the document listening for the change made event, let's have another element on the page issue that same trigger. The code to handle that event has already been written at the document level, so all this new element has to do is trigger that event. And of course, we'll pass in the ID of the event target. All right, time to see our code in action. You go over to the text field, enter value, hit tab, and our value shows up in our save area. Then let's click the button, and that shows up. And now let's clear it. Success. So now that we are using our custom triggers, we have some great power at our fingertips. However, there are some potential problems that we should avoid. If you have lots of elements on the page, and every element is listening, you run into a few issues. First, it becomes harder to maintain since you have so many elements making code calls. The other problem we need to watch out for, especially in the world of mobile development, is excessive memory use. Each listener ends up adding a little bit of memory use to the page, so if we have lots and lots of listeners, you end up needing to use a lot more memory than necessary. A way to avoid some of those problems is to use the DOM to our advantage. We can use event bubbling, which happens natively in the DOM, to handle all these listeners and triggers. 
So if we provide a wrapper around the elements that we'll be working with, we can use that element as the point of contact for triggers and listeners. To illustrate our point, I've modified the HTML form a little bit. You will notice that we now have a wrapper around all of our input fields, and I've added a few other types of input fields so you can see how putting a listener at the wrapper will catch all three inputs change events. Okay, let's update our code to make it work more efficiently and without having too much clutter around. The first thing we're going to do, though, is take the trigger call and move it to a separate function. Since anonymous functions are all treated individually, you can still end up with lots of extra functions lying around using up memory. By giving it a name, the function will only occur once, no matter how many times it's attached. One note about using stop propagation, which I'm going to be putting in right here. In general, I prefer not to use it, and I suggest that most developers don't, since you never really know when your modular code is going to be put on a page. If anything else on that page needs the event, it's best to let it go through and let the application developer handle the event propagation. For the purpose of our example, to keep things clean and simple, I'm going to put it in. So now let's grab the wrapper, and we're going to have the wrapper listen for the change event, and when it does, it's going to trigger our function. And that's as simple as adding the change listener and the name of our function. You'll notice no parentheses because the function is not actually being called then, we're just telling the browser to make the call when it occurs. Alright, now to see our revised code in action. Let's put a value in the text field, the tab, Make some selections in the select box, click a radio button, and notice the idea of the fields are showing up even though they're not individually being listened to. Everything's being caught at the wrapper. Let's click our button to clear it, and we're done. Thank you for spending this time with me, and I hope what we've gone through today will help you in your future projects.